Bob has said, my name is Wade Noble. I am chairman of the Colorado River Water Users Association Resolutions Committee. The process for considering the resolutions each year is that the resolution committee meets and develops resolutions based upon the previous revolutions, revolutions, resolutions. We've only had one revolt in about the 40 years that I've been working on the committee. <laughs> At any rate, we consider the resolutions. We modify, change, add, or delete resolutions as deemed appropriate and then recommend propose the, the proposed resolutions to the CRUA Board of Trustees and the state caucuses. Each of those considers the resolutions and approves them. We arrive at our business meeting today with the Board of Trustees having approved the proposed resolutions and each of the state caucuses having approved the proposed resolutions. Let's see if we wait just one more second. There we go, we got our last member. The chair now sees a quorum. <laughs> it is proposed that the membership adopt the resolutions proposed for the year 2024 for the Colorado River Water Users Association. All of those in favor, please say aye. The ayes have it, appear to have it, and it is so ordered we have adopted the resolutions for 2024, and we thank you. Thank you, Wade. Really appreciate your work. Uh, next item of business is to consider the slate of officers as put forth by the nominations committee which was also voted on and approved by the Board of Trustees on Wednesday for consideration by the membership. As President, Gene Shawcroft from Utah. As Vice President, Keith Barron from Wyoming. As Secretary Treasurer, Lisa Anderson of Utah. As Assistant Secretary Treasurer, Mitch Bishop of Nevada. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, the motion carries. Congratulations, Gene, and the rest of the group. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite our president-elect, Gene Shawcroft, to come forward and say a few words. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, looks like we're a little thin in numbers this morning, but I'm sure that will pick up in just a few minutes. Uh, all I want to do this morning is express gratitude to many, many who have made this conference what it is. As I was sitting in our breakfast caucus yesterday morning, I thought about all of the logistics that have to happen to make this conference come off the way it does. And I'm just grateful for all of those who make this happen. And I'd particularly like to express gratitude to Mitch um, and Jordan and Andy and the other Mitch for all the great work that they do and would like to give them a round of applause. It's an honor to be associated with this great um, effort. Colorado River water users have been coming to these meetings for longer than I want to admit. And uh, when I first came, I don't think we would have filled this one row of chairs. And uh, the interest in Colorado River, for some reason, has increased over time. And uh, I am thrilled to be part of an organization that looks for solutions rather than just likes to stir the pot. So thanks to everyone who does a great job of doing that. Uh, at this time, I would like to ask um, um, <clears throat> President Chavez to please come forward. While he's coming forward, I would like to um, have you all recognize Mitch has in front of us a photograph called Falls of the Animas. This is a photograph taken by Farmington, New Mexico photographer Patrick Hazen, entitled, as I mentioned, Fall on the Animas. Mr. Hazen took the photo expressly to commemorate President Chavez's term as CRUA president, and we'd like to present that to him at this time. On behalf of the association, congratulations.
Thank you all. And if you look at your program, you'll see on near the back page all of those who serve on committees. And I know what I pay Lisa Anderson to do what she does. And uh, she does a lot of work in addition to what's on here. Now, I know all these committee members make triple digits because of their service on these committees. So be sure and uh, let them know how grateful you are for those triple digits that generally are all on the right-hand side of a decimal point for the great efforts in their service here. So thanks to all. We appreciate your effort and, and service on committees. If you're interested in serving on committees, let us know. There's always room for great thoughts and uh, great heads. So congratulations to those who put this off and we look uh, pull, pull this uh, meeting off and we look forward to a great year. And uh, I, I do want to just mention in closing how grateful I am for the thoughts that were offered in a prayer by Chair Hart last year and President Joaquin this year. I, I am of the opinion that we don't pause long enough to express gratitude to our Mother Nature and uh, agree with them that uh, perhaps a little more reliance on that element might help us, as it certainly did last year. So thank you all, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you, Jane. Really appreciate that, those comments. There being no further business, the 2023 business meeting is adjourned. Up next is on the agenda is uh, bringing it all together, and I would like to introduce the Rob Manning, who is the director of communications for the Bureau of Reclamation, and is responsible for its national communication and engagement strategies. Thank you, Rob, and welcome. Thank you, President Chavez, and congratulations to Team Crew on a wonderful conference this week. Let's give him a round of applause. Well, good morning and welcome to Federal Friday. Uh, it's an honor to be here. My name is Rob Manning. Uh, it's been a wonderful conference and uh, it's been an honor to meet all of you here. Uh, on behalf of the Bureau of Reclamation, thank you for your partnership and support as we all work together to protect the Colorado River system. For more than 121 years, the Bureau of Reclamation has sustained its mission across the 17 western states with solutions grounded in partnership and collaboration. And this core principle is guiding our work as we bring every tool and every resource to bear to protect the stability and the sustainability of the system. The essence of Federal Friday is our ironclad partnerships. And we have several important discussions today, which include, and we're very excited about, uh, brief opening remarks by Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science, Michael Brain, uh, brief updates by Reclamation's regional directors for both the upper and lower Colorado River Basin regions, uh, the Department of the Interior's former Assistant Secretary for Water and Science, Ann Castle, will moderate a panel and dialogue with the Colorado River tribes, and we're really excited about that panel. And then Reclamation's Deputy Commissioner for Operations, David Palumbo, will moderate a panel and dialogue with our Mexican and U.S. diplomatic partners. And thank you for all the coordination that, that went into that dialogue. And then we'll hear closing remarks from uh, Commissioner Tootin. And we're really excited to engage in these discussions. Uh, and thank you in advance for supporting this critical dialogue today and beyond. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science, Michael Brain, has served in a variety of positions in the U.S. House of Representatives, including as counsel for the Subcommittee on Water Resources and the Environment, and as a professional staffer for the Subcommittee on Energy and Water Development Appropriations. In these roles, he developed funding bills that support national water infrastructure, agriculture, and climate resilience across the nation. He was most recently the Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Reclamation. Please join me in a round of applause to welcome Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science, Michael Brain.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for the introduction, and thank you for your leadership. I want to echo Gene's gratitude for everyone who has made this week the success that it has been. Um, and I really want to thank everyone here today for the opportunity to speak with you briefly. As Rob mentioned, my name is Michael Brain, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science within the Department of the Interior. There, I have the privilege of working with both the Bureau of Reclamation and the United States Geologic Survey. Prior to this role, as Rob mentioned, I was the Deputy Commissioner for Reclamation, where I had the pleasure of working with many of you that are in this room today, and some of you I even may have worked with previously when I was working on Capitol Hill. During today's Federal Friday session, you'll hear from a number of Reclamation leaders who will share details on operations collaborations with tribal nations and Mexico, and steps the Bureau is taking to protect the Colorado River system. I'm very grateful for the time I spent working with these professionals, and I remain appreciative of the work that they do on a daily basis. I'd like to use my time, however, to focus on what the Department of the Interior is how the Department of the Interior is implementing President Biden's Investing in America agenda to build a more resilient American West. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act provided generational resources to support the Department's work. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law invests $28 billion to jumpstart economic investment and address long-standing interior needs and $2.5 billion to fulfill pre-existing Indian water rights settlements. Last month, on the second anniversary of President Biden's signing of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the department released an analysis which estimates that investments from the historic law supported on average nearly 18,000 jobs each year and contributed an average of $2 billion each year to the economy. Across fiscal years 2022 and 2023, the BIL Water Resources Program alone supported some 7,000 jobs and contributed nearly $900 million to the economy. To date, the Bureau of Reclamation has proudly allocated BIL funding to 402 projects for $2.7 billion. Across the seven Colorado River Basin states combined, 257 projects have been selected for a total of $1.9 billion. Those investments are creating hundreds of thousands of acre feet of new water supplies and have enabled Reclamation to stand up new programs to support large scale water recycling, small water storage, and opportunities for multi benefit and nature based infrastructure projects. With these historic investments, Reclamation is reaching new communities in urban, suburban, and rural parts of the United States with funding opportunities that have been specifically targeted to reach and facilitate partic participation with disadvantaged communities and underserved communities. It's all part of President Biden's Investing in America agenda and the Biden-Harris administration's all-of-government approach to enhance the resilience of the West to drought and climate change. To that end, across all of government, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law invests over $50 billion for the largest upgrade to the nation's water infrastructure in history. These funds have already financed over 1,200 drinking and wastewater projects across this country. More clean water projects under construction by the Bureau of Reclamation include the Arkansas Valley Conduit, which will convey clean water to 40 communities and a projected future population of 50,000. The Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project that will provide a long-term sustainable water supply to meet future population needs of approximately 250,000 people. And the Lewis and Clark Regional Water System that will deliver clean water to over 350,000 people. The changes in climate that we are seeing are bringing people together to find solutions. And that's really the case with these projects as it is with the progress that has been made across the Colorado River Basin. The ever-changing climate variability means that we can't depend on our old models anymore, and we can't depend on our old attitudes to drive our thinking on water availability. 
we need to continue to challenge ourselves to think creatively and expansively about how to use our available water resources judiciously. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now across the basin. And it's evidenced by the revised SEIS for near-term Colorado River operations, which we released in October. Containing the Lower Basin State's proposal as the proposed alternative, the revised draft provides tools in both the upper and lower basins to protect critical infrastructure at Lakes Powell and Mead. And the proposed action was developed based on strong partnership in the basin. It reflects a collaborative focus that we need to cross the basin as we develop long-term guidelines that will carry us into the future beyond 2026. We also saw this kind of innovative approach earlier this week when the Interior Department joined the Gila River Indian community in Arizona to announce $6 million for the solar panel installation over the community's irrigation canals. This kind of project really underscores how President Biden's Investing in America agenda is unlocking resources for new and creative ways to combat the climate crisis. This progress that I've talked about is indicative of the department's commitment to working with everyone here today. That includes the basin states, tribes, municipalities, water districts, farmers, irrigators, and in addition to our great partner, the country of Mexico, to build a more resilient future for the Colorado River Basin. A primary focus will be leveraging the generational investments from President Biden's Investing in America agenda. With the best available science at hand, combined with historic investments of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we at the Department look forward to continued engagement with you as we work towards our shared vision of a more resilient Colorado River. It's our collective continued engagement that will define what a resilient, restored basin looks like and how it serves our communities in the future. We all know firsthand how crucial this engagement is for the Colorado River, and the Department of the Interior truly appreciates your partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. At this time, I am honored to introduce Reclamation's regional directors. I'd like to welcome them, them to the stage for both the upper and lower Colorado River Basin regions. Thank you. Jackie Gould uh, is the regional director for the lower Colorado Basin region. She has more than 30 years of experience with reclamation and leads over 800 employees in the region. And she oversees hydropower operations and maintenance for 15 facilities, including the iconic Hoover Dam. She previously served as the deputy regional director in the lower Colorado Basin region and has held a variety of leadership positions throughout reclamation, including as the area manager for the Eastern Colorado Area Office where she led all aspects of the Colorado Big Thompson and Frying Pan Arkansas projects. And Wayne Pullen is the regional director for the upper Colorado Basin region. He has nearly 30 years of experience with reclamation and leads a team of reclamation professionals who manage 82 projects and dams, including 19 hydroelectric power plants, providing water to approximately 5.7 million people living in the region and electricity for almost 6 million power users. He previously served as the Deputy Regional Director in the Upper Colorado Basin region and has held a variety of leadership positions throughout reclamation, including as the Area Manager for the Provo Area Office and as Program Coordinator in the Department of the Interior Central Utah Project Completion Act Office. He began his federal service with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Foreign Agricultural Service, where he implemented an agricultural marketing and food aid program in Asia and the Middle East. Please join me in a round of applause for both of our regional directors. <laughs> Director Gould. Thank you, thank you, Rob, and my favorite day of crew is Federal Friday. 
not be only because it's the last day of crew and we all get to go home to our families, but that we get to express some of the accomplishments that we received, and this year was certainly special for Lower Colorado Basin. I don't want to, Wayne did a lot of things in the Upper Basin. I don't want to short that, but I'm going to focus on the region that I'm the director for, Lower Colorado Basin. And we've done great things this year. We have done, we've worked hard and done wonderful things. Who's, hey Rob, who's doing the slides? Who's doing the slides? The slides. I do have a slide to show um, as I pull it up. You've all probably seen it if you've been in any of our Bureau of Reclamation, Lower Colorado, Colorado Basin hydrology meetings. We call, that's, we need the other slide with the green on it. There, the rainbow slide, some people call it a cricket slide or a grasshopper leg slide. Um, it has a lot of names. Um, and I wanted to um, show the impact of the additional conservation efforts, such as the intens intentionally created surplus, Mexico's water reserve, system conservation agreements that resulted in water and mead, the drought contingency plan, and other efforts, such as the 242 well field expansion project in Yuma, and the Brock Reservoir um, have all helped contribute to Lake Mead since 2007. The graph demonstrates the significant impact of those various conservation efforts totaling 6.3 million acre feet through 2023 and have had an effect on Lake Mead elevations um, resulting in nearly 100 feet higher than it would have been without those efforts. So all of those efforts I believe have been very effective and it's been amazing to see uh, that play forward. With Lake Mead only about a third full at the beginning of the year, we uh, focused on what we can do into 2023, working with our tribes, our states, our in, and our partners with Mexico. That's uh, 20, that's 30 Native American tribes in the basin. We have 10 states, seven basin states in the U.S. and two in Mexico. So if we pull up the next slide, oh, I guess that's me, right? Well, it is, okay, got it. Um, this graph is new to our presentation um, slide deck, and it really shows the results of some of those great things that we've accomplished in the lower basin in 2023. It was an extraordinarily challenging year, operationally, hydrologically with, rec with record amounts of conservation. Consumptive use in the lower basin resulting from required reductions and voluntary additional conservation is projected to be the lowest since 1982. That's 30 years. And about um, the lowest consumptive use since 1972. That's 40 years, it's a long time. and. Um, the, uh, so, okay, so, so this slide shows a comparison of Lake Mead elevations from January 2023 and the actual elevations through December of 2023. It shows, the bar chart kind of shows a summary of the hydrologic improvements both in the upper basin through Lake Powell's release and lower basin tributaries, which we were, uh, had an, a very unusual amount of additional inflow into the lower basin between Lake Powell and downstream from there. The chart shows um, that um, the comparison of those lake meat elevations. The dashed line would have been where the, where the elevation would have been, that's 40 feet lower than the red line, which is where it is today. Lake Mead was projected to drop to an elevation of 1027 at the end of 2023. Um, that's just barely above our level three shortage condition in the lower basin. And at very near to critical elevations for Lake Mead. The improved hydrology and the extensive conservation efforts um, is now projected 
to end this, this December of 2023 at elevation 1068. That's that solid red line. That's 41 and a half feet higher than was projected at the beginning of the year. And it and the 40 additional feet was really based on that good hydrology and then the uh, the conservation efforts that we took on. Uh, increase in Lake Powell's balancing release as compared to the January study above tributary inflows in the lower basin, both above and below Lake Mead and those additional conservation efforts from system conservation agreements and intentional created surplus and other conserved water and Mexico's reserve um, are all components of that as it shows in the bar chart on the right. Um, the Lake Powell's additional release added 16 feet to Meade's elevation. The lower basin tributary inflows added about 11 feet to Lake Mead. And combined additional conservation efforts added about 14 feet to Lake Mead. So uh, we started out CRUA at the celebration with California parties and signing some of those conservation agreements. Uh, we were in Arizona a few a uh, month or so ago doing the same thing. We've been through um, throughout the tribal nation uh, celebrating agreements with them as well. All those efforts really resulted in tier one elevation for this year when we would have been in tier three and it's projecting a tier two elevation in 2026. So that bought us some time. The hydrology bought us about one year and the conservation efforts bought us about three years of relief. This was all really possible through the $2 billion Investment Reduction Act. The, of that uh, total was $2 billion. Of that, $1.5 billion came to the lower basin. Uh, so I spent that in addition to our discretionary budget of about $230 million. So the work that was done, it was incredible by the staff in the lower basin to be able to put out those many conservation agreements, uh, infrastructure projects in one year time. That was six times our normal budget that we were executed. So we've accomplished great things and we are looking forward to doing a lot in the future. We're not done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. And uh, I want to begin by thanking all those who have been involved with the uh, the planning and carrying out of of CRUA this uh, this week. It, uh, as always, it's been wonderful. It was 21 years ago that I attended my first Colorado River Water Users Association meeting. Uh, over in Caesar's Palace, I was sitting about right there. I did not have uh, a lot to do with uh, the larger issues of the Colorado River. And uh, as I listened to the speakers from the department, from reclamation, from the states, from, from tribes and others, uh, I was inspired. I was inspired by the sense of mission that people felt. I was inspired by the progress that was being made collaboratively and uh, um, among the various levels of governments and uh, among the stakeholders. And I said to myself, you know, if, if some point in my career, some point in my career, I would like to work on the big issues of the Colorado River. Now, as I have the chance to spend a few minutes with you today, you might think that my message would be, be careful what you wish for. Uh, it, <laughs> but my message is not that. My message is one of, uh, is I want to tell a story of adaptation. Let me set the stage for, for that. In 2002, when I first attended, uh, 2002 had outclipsed 1977 as the driest year in terms of inflow into, into Lake Powell. And uh, I don't remember if there was a sense of foreboding, but I think those among us who had a, a better sense of vision might have sensed that climate change and aridification was tapping us on the shoulder and letting us know that they had come to visit and were gonna stay a while. It was the beginning of, uh, of continued drought and severe drought on the Colorado River. By 2021, 
2021 stepped in and eclipsed uh, 1977 to take the second worst spot in terms of uh, uh, lowest inflow into Lake Powell. And then 2022 emerged as, a, as another dry year. We didn't know in 20, when 2022 began that we would end that year with Lake Powell at just 25% of, of capacity. So in 2022, as it emerged as a dry year, we began to adapt. And one of the first uh, things we did was um, the states, the tribes, reclamation got together to make use of the tools we have under the Drought Response Operations Agreement. We call this DROA. DROA is a, a tool of, uh, it's a narrow tool with, uh, with limited application, but it is intended to allow us to call upon uh, upper basin reservoirs to make releases to Lake Powell and preserve critical elevations and prevent us from going below the minimum power pool. We got together and agreed that uh, we would, in, uh, in that year, uh, in what was the DROA year, uh, 2022 and 2023, that we would deliver 500,000 acre feet from those, those upper reservoirs. And as the year wore on, we began to implement that. As the, as the winter of uh, uh, December through March of, of 2022 looked like it was going to be dry, we took a second step under DROA, where we cut back, uh, we planned to cut back on the deliveries from Lake Powell, delay them until the summer in order to raise the elevations at, at Lake Powell and further protect those critical elevations. The seven basin states in reclamation took another step in uh, creating uh, operational neutrality for 480,000 uh, acre feet of water in, in Lake Powell. Now, those were the actions we took to adapt to what was emerging in water year 2023 as a, another dry year. Uh, the forecast had fallen from 84% in October to 80% in December, and, and things didn't look so good. As you all know, Mother Nature, exercising what is almost her cruel sense of humor, uh, decided to send us an abundant uh, snowpack uh, in January and February and March. And so that's the second stage of our adaptation. We, uh, we got together, tribes, states, reclamation, and our stakeholders, and uh, moved quickly. And that's good for government organizations to suspend our DROA releases from those upper reservoirs. Then we, uh, the second step we took was that we suspended the uh, the delay of releases from, from Lake Powell, uh, allowing those, uh, those releases to, to go down to Lake Mead. Then we worked together to plan for and uh, uh, initiate and execute a recovery under the Drought Response Operations Agreement. And I'm pleased to tell you that uh, we released uh, under draw about 125,000 acre feet in 2022, by, uh, by the time we suspended DROA, we had released 463,000 acre feet in water year 20, 2023. And it's so pleasing to be able to tell you that we will recover all of that. In other words, we will have raised the elevation and replaced that water in those upper reservoirs uh, by, by February. And uh, that's, that's a real accomplishment. We, uh, the seven basin states and reclamation agreed to suspend the operational neutrality. And then because of the year, the way we started the year, we were in the lower elevation balancing tier. And the challenge for us was to balance, the, uh, balance Lake Powell and Lake Mead by the end of the year. That was unexpectedly difficult because of success in the lower basin. The conservation that had taken place had raised the elevation of Lake Mead. You place on top of that Hurricane K that, uh, 
that delivered a significant amount of water to Southern California, which cut off calls for deliveries out of Lake Mead. And so now in balancing, the challenge was to deliver as little as possible from, from Lake Powell in order to be able to balance a higher than expected Lake Mead. And it was a wonderful thing to watch our operators as they, uh, as they continually tried to undercut the, uh, uh, that scenario. And uh, I'm so proud of the fact that by the end of the year, we balanced to within 0.5%, uh, which st statistically is the center of the bullseye. It's important for us to note that as part of that adaptation too, we took advantage of that water in order to do the first high flow experiment uh, from Lake Powell that we'd been able to do in five years. These high flow experiments pick up sediment that are in the tributaries uh, that, are, that have been delivered from the tributaries into the Colorado Riverbed and they improve the sediment resources in the Grand Canyon. So, it's a great story of adaptation. I am so proud that, uh, that Reclamation acted so well. But as you all know, there's no individual accomplishment uh, on this river. And, and this adaptation, of course, was made possible by a high degree of collaboration. So what are the lessons from this? The, the first one probably is this. If we made any mistake with the 2007 interim guidelines, it was that our vision was not dark enough. And certainly one of the lessons of this year is that as we work toward the post-2026 guidelines, we need to anticipate that we'll face, a, we'll face whiplash years like this one that will require us to, to be able to act uh, in real time. The second, the second lesson is this. We have uh, in this room, in this Colorado River community, the knowledge, the experience, the creativity, uh, the collaborative spirit that will allow us to resolve the, the challenges that we have ahead of us. I have, uh, I have great faith in that. In closing, I'd, I'd like to say this. As you, as you fly from Salt Lake to Phoenix, there are places where you'll get a glimpse of the river and you'll get a glimpse of the Grand Canyon. And uh, when you do, the river reveals herself bordered by those often narrow riparian, uh, riparian sides. She reveals herself to be a, a f almost fragile looking uh, corridor of life that bisects a deeply dry desert. And when you look at her from that, uh, that elevation and that perspective, it's easy to see the river as the spiritual resource that our Native American friends intend us to understand when they tell us that water is life. From that elevation, it's easy to see the river as the environmental resource that it is and to recommit ourselves to attempting to create as natural a river as we possibly can. As you, as you fly into Phoenix and see the irrigated acreage and the, the city that depends upon that river, maybe the first impression is that uh, we have maybe leveraged more from her than we deserve. And at the same time, we realize that we need to maintain uh, sustainable water resources from the river. From that elevation, it's, easy, it's a little easier to set aside our own parochial interests and to realize that it will be compromise and sacrifice from all of us to, uh, to pursue the larger objectives, uh, to pursue the larger mission we have as the Colorado River community. I'm honored to be part of this community. I have great faith in what we'll accomplish moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give our regional directors another round.
Okay. And for those that uh, came in recently, welcome to Federal Friday. Uh, we're excited to see all of you. And I am honored to welcome Ann Castle, who will moderate our Sovereign to Sovereign Dialogue. And this is with the Colorado River Tribes to the stage. Thank you, ma'am. Let's welcome Ann Castle. Ms. Castle is currently a senior fellow at the Getches Wilkinson Center for Natural Resources, Energy, and the Environment at the University of Colorado Law School. She was appointed by President Biden in 2022 as the U.S. Commissioner on the Upper Colorado River Commission. And she was the Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the U.S. Department of the Interior from 2009 until 2014. Ms. Castle is a co-founder of an initiative on universal access to clean water for tribal communities. Again, please welcome Ms. Ann Castle. Thank you, Rob, and good morning to all of you. Uh, it's great to be here this morning. Um, as Rob mentioned, I wear a few different hats um, in connection with the Colorado River, but um, I'm very pleased to be here this morning and moderating this panel as a fellow with the Getches Wilkinson Center at the University of Colorado. Um, we have our panelists assembling. I want to um, thank all of you for coming and participating in what is part one of the Sovereign to Sovereign Dialogues that are taking place this morning. This panel has tribal leaders and representatives who will provide their perspective on the tribal issues of importance within the Colorado River Basin and the Commissioner of Reclamation as a representative of the United States. This will be followed by part two of the Sovereign to Sovereign Dialogues, which will include representatives of uh, the Republic of Mexico and the um, embody the relationship between the United States and Mexico. Before I introduce our panelists, I just want to note that this is the first time there has been a tribal panel on Federal Friday. At Krua. <laughs> and I see that as a recognition of the sovereign status of the 30 Native American tribes within the basin. But maybe even more importantly, I think you've seen over the past three days inclusion of tribal leaders and representatives in virtually every panel and meeting that has taken place at CRUA this year. And we've heard about tribal interests and concerns, <clears throat> whether that's in settlement of tribal water rights, the ability to develop unused tribal water, cultural values in water, those have been part of our discussions. And I think that's a, a real evolution from even a couple of years ago. So this panel is going to focus on the tribal perspectives in the development of the post-2026 guidelines. And to give us that perspective, we have four terrific panelists. I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Just briefly, um, there's more detailed bios in the conference materials. First, we have Amelia Flores of the Colorado River Indian Tribes. Chair Flores is Mojave and an enrolled member of CRIT. She is a tribal librarian and archivist and a linguist as well. And she's been recognized with many awards for her work in those areas. She was elected as the chairwoman of CRIT in 2020, and she's the first woman to hold the chair position. Manuel Hart is the chairman of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. He was raised on the reservation in Toyot, Colorado. He is a staunch advocate for education, for housing, for public health and water issues, 
and he served on multiple boards and commissions in the areas of energy development, public health, and Indian affairs. Brenda Jesus is an elected delegate for the Navajo Nation Council. <clears throat> She's also the chair of the nation's Resources and Development Committee, which is the committee that deals with water issues. She works in the area of construction management, and she's also a certified suicide prevention counselor. And you all know Camille Kalimlim Tutin, the Commissioner of Reclamation. Camille is a Nevada native, a civil engineer, and a fierce advocate for tribal issues in the Colorado River Basin. She served as professional staff in the U.S. House of Representatives for many years and has deep legislative experience. And Commissioner Tutin has also convened three now historic meetings of the 30 Colorado River Basin tribes and federal and state representatives, the most recent of which occurred just this week on Tuesday. And that has marked a new era in tribal relationships in this basin. I've asked each of the panelists <clears throat> to talk about how their tribe would like to participate in the post-2026 process and the results that they would like to see coming out of the end of that process. So we'll hear from the three tribal representatives and then um, we'll hear from Commissioner Tutin with her response. But we'll start with Chair Flores. Kuchkamadu, Nyepimul, Yamilia Flores, Ahamakapchadum, and yet Iman Bench Hipasimul. Greetings, everyone. My name is Amelia Flores, and as uh, Chairwoman, I'm pr uh, happy to be here to be along with my uh, colleagues here in this historical uh, panel for CRUA. And um, I would like to thank Anne for uh, facilitating this um, panel and that uh, we get to have a voice this morning. And that is very important for the tribes in this room. Um, I stand on the so shoulders of my ancestors who taught me to be a strong advocate to protect our land, our water, and our people. And I'm proud to work with a team of dedicated leaders on the Crit Tribal Council, many are, uh, of whom are here today in this audience. As you may know uh, or may not know, the Colorado River Indian Tribes is made up of four tribes, Mojave, Chemueve, Hopi, and Navajo. We are tied to the river, the Colorado River, our namesake. We are tied historically, culturally, and spiritually as a sovereign nation the river is part of who we are as a people, and it is central to our traditions, our culture, and especially to our identity. Protection of our river is an exercise of our sovereignty and a sacred duty. The Mojaves have been farmers on Crit's land since time immemorial and will continue to be farmers. As stewards, we have the responsibility to care for the river. We strive to preserve our culture and protect our future. But this can only be done if we all strive to protect and work together for the river. Crit's connection to the river was acknowledged by the Supreme Court decree in Arizona versus California through the recognition of our present perfected rights, which are the most senior water rights on the Colorado River. Not only is the river, the Colorado River, our namesake, it is our economic lifeblood. Our farming operations provide both the economic and cultural for support for everything in our community. Agriculture on our land supports the nation's food, fiber, and forage needs, from carrots, potatoes, dairy and beef cattle, to cotton and alfalfa. 
When the Colorado River Compact was signed in 1922, over a hundred years ago, tribes, tribal nations were not at the table, even though the Winters Doctrine was already established by the U.S. Supreme Court. And tribes have had water rights, or have water rights, up to 20% of the river, 25% not 20%, 25%. That's one-fourth of the river. That's, I like to see percentages, so that's one-fourth of the river. So in 20, 27, uh, tribes were again not part of the process in the development of the Colorado River Interim Guidelines. We are at the end of, the tw of 2023, so it is time to right that historical wrong. The Biden administration and reclamation under the leadership of Commissioner Tutin have done more than any other administration to engage tribal nations in a substantive and meaningful way. The administration has had great strides in establishing working relationships and setting up processes to keep tribal nations more informed. Resources have been allocated to provide the technical assistance so that tribal nations can have better engagement in the conversation. Thank you, Commissioner, for showing leadership and in investing your political capital in tribes. You have treated us with respect, and I am proud to call you my friend. I also appreciate the states that have been supportive of the administration's outreach, as it is, it is not only up to the administration to engage and work with tribal nations on a sovereign basis, but the states have an obligation here too, because tribes are sovereign nations, and as sovereign nations, we should be treated as such. Now, while great strides are being made, there is still more work to do. The Getches Wilkinson Center recently published a report showing that tribal nations hold up to 25% of water rights on the Colorado River. This number, it doesn't even account for the amount of water rights for tribal nations that are still outstanding and that are not recognized. Yet despite holding up to the 25% of water rights of the river, we are still not directly engaged in the process that determines its future. One fourth, again, I say one fourth of the river, our livelihoods and our, our traditions have no voice. We must do better. So I've heard all the arguments as to why it's not feasible to have representation of tribes at the negotiation table with the state and federal governments. I'm not buying it. I look around this room and I see a lot of degreed people in this room, a lot of smart people and the Colorado River users have over 100 years of knowledge and experiences managing the river. So let's figure this out together. Tribes have been stewarding this river since time immemorial. So I ask all of you to join us in figuring out how to work together so that tribes have a real say, not something on paper, have a real say, have a voice, so that we can create durable and equitable solutions to the challenges we face. With that in mind, I invite the states and the federal governments to shift the discussion from whether tribes as sovereign governments should be at the table to an open dialogue about how we can find a way 
for direct tribal participation at the table. So simply put, we cannot have a shared future without shared decision making. Thank you for the opportunity to say these few words uh, on behalf of the Colorado River Indian tribes. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Flores. Thank you, Chair Flores, very much for those remarks. And we'll now hear from Chairman Hart. Good morning. So I said good morning to each one of you, my friends, my relatives, as we come here to talk about water and looking toward the future for our children and our children that are not here yet. We need to envision that. We are, I'm from the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe up in southwest Colorado. Our lands go into New Mexico and into Utah. I have 2,100 enrolled members with my tribe, and we have a 600,000 acre land base. It's good to see all of you here today. Thank you for the upper and lower regional directors and their comments, Commissioner Tootin, and everybody that's here. CRUA is, is a very important conference for all of us here in the Colorado River Basin. As we look behind me, all the flags that are here, the two countries, the seven states, and the 10 tribes on the Colorado River. But there's 20 more tribes that are also within the Colorado River Basin. Each one of them, sovereign, governments, working together for a better tomorrow. Last night, I was working on my speech, and I got a little frustrated because my laptop wouldn't work. I couldn't get into my iPhone um, internet side. I was just getting frustrated, and I said, boy, I'm gonna have to go back to basics. So I wrote my speech last night, and that's what I think we need to do is take a step back. 100 years now since the compact has been written, 100 years of challenges, 100 years of use, upper and lower basin. Who's really involved? Whose water is it? How can we use it? The five different uses we have, some of them exceeded other, other uses than the other one. But our needs of supply and demand is the biggest issue that we face today. We just don't have enough supply to meet the demand. And 100 years is coming up with the new interim guidelines in 2026. So as we start to look at that, how do we work together as sovereign nations, as a government to government? So today, the sovereign to sovereign dialogue we're having with tribal leaders here and out there, with state governments, with municipalities, with the federal government, the Bureau of Reclamation, and all their staff, and all of our staff, in coming up with things we put here on the table to discuss. Yes, we have disagreements. Yes, some people are more, using more water than others, but how do we come to this resolution? We're getting ready to go into Christmas, the holidays. We're gonna have family gather at our tables, share food, talk about what's going on in each one of our family lives. Then we go into the new year, we start again. How do we resolve this issue? How do we come to a consensus? There was a thing that was mentioned earlier in this conference, three things. Litigation, we don't wanna go there. <laughs> Legislation, that's something that's a possibility if there's a disagreement. But the ultimate is to come to a consensus and agree that we're willing to work together, that each one of us take on that role of the responsibility of where we're at today. Climate change is here. It's upon us, and we know it. How do we adapt to it? How do we figure this out for our population that's growing? As each one of you travel the United States, and you see these cities growing up with more housing, more housing development, more economic development, and you say, where is this water gonna come from to meet the needs of these growing populations. Do we look at the, the gray water? Do we look at our regular water? Do we look at the aquifer? How do we recharge the aquifer? We have to think of many, many things 